It's time to feel the rage. Welcome to Film Rage, where we talk movies. The doors to the cinemas are still locked, so we continue to scream. Directors and actors, beware as you cannot hide from the rage. My name is Bryce, and I'm part of the Film Rage crew, which also includes Jim. Hello, Jim. Hey, hey. Arr. With the introductions out of the way, well, let's rage on. All right. Well, this week, we're streaming Open Rage, The List, Rage or Dare, and then we start begging our government to let cinemas open at the same time as restaurants. And for those of you who are only listening to us and not watching us on our YouTube channel, you will not know that I, or should I say, are not watching us on YouTube, matey. I am now winking with my eye that is covered. We're going to do a promo for our friends, the Dumb Found Dead podcast. Wank, wank. You enjoyed our comedy, puns, and laughter? If so, come join two good brothers, John and Patrick, as we discuss some of the craziest ways people die. That's so bizarre, strange, and borderline comical that'll leave you dumbfounded. You can follow this podcast on all major platforms, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many more. And make sure to follow us on social media on Instagram at the Dumbfounded Pod and on Twitter at TBFE Pod. And remember, think ahead, don't be dumbfounded. Streaming. And what are we doing? We're streaming, Jim. This week, we, as per usual over these past few months, have uh, been doing a lot of streaming. We are going to start by a little movie by the name of Palmer. It is currently streaming on Apple+. Plus. We. So, Palmer, Justin uh, Justin Justin Timberlake. Exactly. Justin Timberlake stars in this tale of growth and tolerance. An ex-con finds himself through a series of events taking care of a young boy. The understated performance by Timberlake as Palmer, combined with the chemistry with his young co-star Ryder Allen as Sam, drive this story. The scenes between these two have an authenticity from the first time they are introduced. You can see how Palmer, who at first holds Sam at arm's length, eventually lets him all the way in. This film surprised me as I felt many times that Palmer may react in a certain way, but the story never went down that road. Palmer is loyal, and once he let Sam into his life, he was going to have his back no matter what the consequences. The supporting cast was solid as well, with Juno Temple as Sam's mom, and the always great June Squibb as Palmer's grandmother, Vivian. The one part of the story that I could not that I could have done without was the romantic relationship between Sam's teacher, Miss Maggie, and Palmer. I felt that this storyline should have been left out as I felt it distracted from the overall tone of the film. Miss Maggie was an important character in this, but getting involved with Palmer on an intimate level was unnecessary. Still lots of great performances. Stellar direction from Fisher Stevens and a positive message of tolerance make this film worth seeing. The silly side story between Palmer and Miss Maggie make the overall impression meh. Oh, okay then. Well, I think we had some, I think we had some similar themes, but I'm going to disagree with you a bit. Uh, so I am a pretty big fan of June Squibb, as you've so rightfully mentioned. Also, JT, I'm a pretty big fan of JT, actually, too. I don't normally see, like, he doesn't normally do a bad job of acting. I just knew he was an alpha dog. I think he uh, had a dick in the box. And he, I think he sings or something. He does do some singing. Yeah. Just not a lot in movies. I think he, wasn't he in the uh, social network? 
I think he was in that too. He's been in a bunch of I, stuff. I don't know. I don't know who this guy is. He's a he's an actor and a singer. He's everything. Let's face it. Uh, man. Yeah. Uh, the soundtrack was awesome, by the way. Vampire Weekend in a soundtrack. I'm like hooked. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Vampire Weekend. Uh, so, uh, uh, small towns in the South, gotta love them. Sexists, racist, judgy church people. Yep, you know, friendly folk. It's great. Love it. Uh, mm -hmm. By the way, this is how a sports movie should play out. They have one football game, and Palmer who is a football player, but moves on with his life, maybe not the way that he was expecting, goes to prison first, but doesn't dwell on football the whole movie. Okay, so maybe it wasn't a sports movie, but this is how much sports I want to see in a movie if it's got anything to do with sports. I just had to put that out there. Uh, I don't know what that has to do with the price of tea in China, but well, go ahead. It, it has to show you that not everybody can't get over their life as a sports person. But, you know, he went to prison and probably had to pick up some soap because he's pretty cute. I can't remember a movie where I have cried as much as I have in this film. It's heartwarming, redemptive, and sad and joyful. It is predictable, yes. But then I don't mind because guess what? I am so dialed into these great characters that were developed. JT does a great job, as does the CLF writer Alan as Sam. Uh, gets a character-driven Apple Plus original Mondo. My favorite line, your breath smells kind of funny. <laughs> I love that line. Uh, I think there is a couple of things we should unpack. Obviously, you brought right, it up with the, with the love yep. interest. So let's do uh, Yeah, see. You I, take that out. This is Mondo. Yeah, see, I, it didn't bother me so much. You uh, put it in. This is. Yeah, just it annoyed me so much that I'm like, wow, if that wasn't in this, boy, I'd be enjoying this so much more. But I was loving this, loving this movie all the way up until that point. Yeah, it didn't and bother then me. From that point, I just wrecked the rest of the movie. Uh, I, I can kind of get of it. Good. Yeah, I can, I can kind of get it. Uh, because there was parts I don't think necessarily the sex scenes in the movie were needed. But <laughs> no kidding. But I, but I don't. I personally didn't mind the fact that JT's character got something good happened to him. Like to me, it was like, here's your reward. You know, if he's, if he's going to have a relationship, it might as well be with an awesome person who, you know, they, they, she was a great character. And the thing, there's the no thing reason is, why. I, I, yeah. I got no problem with their introducing and I got no problem of there being an attraction between them because obviously they're, they're a couple of good looking people. Mm -hmm. But in the context of this film, we didn't, we needed not to go down that avenue. You can touch upon, yes, there's some sexual tension here, but to go all the way like they did with it just completely took away from what the movie was trying to accomplish, in my opinion. Well, that's too bad. Cause I, I, I kind of see where your point is, but I'm going to tactfully, no, that's not my style. Untactfully disagree with you it didn't take it didn't bother me enough that i made it mad for me ah the other yeah, thing so is totally okay mad it up totally mad it up okay so how do you know how old june squib is by the way uh i don't i would guess that she's in her 70s yeah she's 92 this year holy crap 90 freaking two and she's she awesome. she is awesome yeah i'm just like what yeah no I, you got no arguments there. I can't say one bad thing about June Squibb. And she, as usual, was, I just wish that she, you know, would have lasted a little longer because I was enjoying her so much. Uh, uh, that, that that scene where they're they're at the at the they're at the table there, where where you know, uh, young Sam is telling uh, telling Veronica, you know, Grandma to uh, you know, uh, apologize uh, for a accusation that she made. Yeah. Um, little little kid you know way beyond his years there yeah. and just such an enjoyable scene um and there were you know every time she was on the screen and those three interacting with each other i mean it was gold yeah i just just wish that it didn't get tanked by a silly side love story eh, didn't bother me uh but okay here here was something as we're watching the movie and yeah. you know when when sam's mom goes missing 
And so what happens? They, they try and call the mom like probably five times. No one leaves her a message. Like that was the, that was a part that I'm kind of like, okay, could someone maybe leave her a message? Like mm. they just call and then the message, her answering machine comes on and then they just hang up. I was like, what? Shouldn't somebody That's leave her I a do. message? <laughs> yeah. I, can't, I don't leave messages. As soon as yeah, the but, answering machine comes on, I just go click. Yeah, like, but no, you're, not, you're, you're not you taking care of her child. In age, you're, you're, seeing, you're seeing my number. You obviously don't want to talk to me, so I ain't leaving you a message. Right, and uh, you don't, you're not having to be taking care of a 8-year-old boy or 10-year-old boy. Uh, whatever. Uh, how about, bitch, get back and pick up your kid because you're neglecting him. Yeah, obviously they knew that, you know, the life they were giving them at the time was probably better than her coming back. So they're like, yeah, let's not leave a message. Yep, they, yet Take they still kept kid. calling her. <laughs> That's his mom. You got to give her a chance. You gave her a chance by not leaving her a message. Okay. Why Just would so you leave I... her a message? I wouldn't leave her a message. Come I'd home. Call. She's not going to pick up. She obviously doesn't care. Cool. I'll Maybe take care she's... of your kid. Maybe leave her a message or text her. I love that. I love this kid. I'll take care of him. No problem. Yeah, they could have left that I, as a message. <laughs> I'm not leaving. No, I'm not leaving her a message. Screw her. Well, apparently she doesn't, want to, she doesn't want to pick up the phone, and she obviously doesn't care about her kid enough. And screw her. Well, I think it was obvious she didn't care about her kid enough. That's for sure. <laughs> I think she cared about her kid a lot, but she just had a lot of problems, and sometimes those problems overshadow the love that you feel for your, your uh, child, and it's it's sad, and it happens. Our matey, <laughs> it certainly does. <laughs> hey, anyway, now you're bumming me out. Let's I love it. On. Let's get bummed. <laughs> but then there's love. It makes you happy. Okay, so we also saw the rental on Ooh. Prime Prime Video. Two couples Prime. rent a vacation home for what should be a celebratory weekend getaway. And again, I am winking with my patched eye. Uh, director David Franco? What? What? Written by David Franco and what? Joe Swanberg? Plus, wow. plus three more writing credits. Hmm. So let's do the count. There's five. Uh, stars Dan Stevens, Allison Brie, and Sheila Vand. So, the rental. Some convenient things happen in this movie, for sure. Uh, like the dog, for example, just happens to be outside all the time. Makes no sense, especially for someone who's completely protective of the dog. Just have to throw it out there. Very, very slow bill in the story that has been told so many times before. Very Cabin in the Woodsy-esque. Uh, at 33 minutes in, nothing has really happened at all. No suspense yeah, whatsoever. That was, that was the part I enjoyed. Yeah, I know it, it would have been. Uh, as we have talked before, I love Alison Brie, so it was worth waiting if stuff was going to eventually happen. Interesting she did not appear nude in this one. Huh. She seems to be on a, a kick of being nude in her movie, so I wonder why she stopped for this one. But, you know. Uh, do they find a camera in the shower? And then they can't come up with a better idea why they shouldn't stay another night. They can't, you know, like, oh, how about I've got terrible stomach pains or I need to be rushed to the hospital because I've got food poisoning or how about any reason to leave the house? So think for the line from the Amity Horror. When the hell the house tells you to get out, get out of the motherfucking house. I get it. They cheated on their par partners, uh, but really, Jorge, really? So the pervis pervert racist gets killed also, basically for like two minutes. He hasn't been dead for that long. So what do they do? They come back in and they touch his neck. They, they're, they're apparently medically gifted enough to be able to tell someone's dead by touching their neck, but not one of them knows how to do CPR. I'm kind of like, What? He was dead for no more than two minutes. I don't know that he was a pervert racist. I'm still undecided on that. He was 100% racist. Uh, the pervert part is mm. maybe debatable. 
but he's 100 yeah. percent racist that was completely shown everything after the death just started annoying me did the foreshadowing of the lock room in the basement not make you think you should check there first before you move the dead body or the shower goes on randomly and alice and Bree's character just looks around uh amityver horror people get the fuck out of the house she sees the video upstairs that magically played by itself and she doesn't get suspicious about why it played or who played it. Uh, so she's mad at her husband, but really? Uh, oh, wait. She sees, or she finally sees things when she gets the spikes on the road. Oh, right. And that's the time you should be suspicious. Absolutely. Didn't think about it at all. For the most part, this film annoyed me pretty much from start to finish. Not a fan of slashers, as we know, at the best of times. It does get bonus points for the kill, for the kill shots. It was 100% a slasher uh, yeah. for the kill shots, though, when they finally came, they were satisfying. The kill shots were pretty good. I was annoyed by most of it, but not all of it. It wasn't really that original and I didn't love it, but because it scared my wife enough for her to hide her eyes for most of the end of the movie, it gets a low, low meh just for that reason alone. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I actually thought this was mm, solid first effort from Dave Franco as a director. Uh, the tension that exists between the characters within is presented early on and effectively sets the stage for the rest of the movie. It's definitely well acted. Atmospherically, it was solid. It is sort of like two movies in one with the first half a character study of two couples that have made mistakes in the past and are about to have those manifest again. Um, but then bad decisions are made, compounded by more bad decisions, and eventually this causes the film to morph into a bit of a horror movie. Um, everything is reasonably effective. I'm sure that Dave Franco will make a, some very good films in the future. This, you know, really wasn't a good film it was an okay film <laughs> uh it was meh so what level of meh was it high medium or low <laughs> it was just it, meh it was mid meh <laughs> it, it was it was mid meh it was mid meh it was, it was just... <laughs> okay so we're a little on the same page this was a hundred percent this yeah. was a yeah triple bang it uh the this was 100% a slasher movie. It just the slasher didn't happen until the end of the movie because they even set it yeah. up for a sequel. It was very a less, drama. It was a very, relationship drama. Uh, it was killing me almost as much as the slasher it was, was. It was a relationship drama with a little bit of, you know, killing at the end. <laughs> that was literally the best part of the movie was the last yeah. 15 minutes. Actually, the yeah, last five minutes was the best. There's a lot going on. I don't know. So people could watch it, fast forward to it, it was, to it was, the end. It was like and then, two movies in one. It's like you got a twofer, but they're both. Yeah. It's like a double feature, but it took place in 90 minutes. Like medium meh. There you go. <laughs> it's totally medium meh. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's, let's talk dig. About else. Let's dig, yeah. Doug. Yes, let's definitely dig. You so dig. we watched. Uh, the Dig, which is currently available on something named Netflix. Never this, heard of it. Yes, you have. <laughs> this is a story of the Sutton Who find of 1939, which took place on Edith Pretty's property in Suffolk, England. Amateur archaeologist Basil Brown is hired to excavate some huge mounds on Pretty's property and discovers an 88-foot ship dating back to the Anglo-Saxon period. What? Then within the yeah, I know. Crazy, right? Then within the ship, there was a burial chamber filled with many other goodies. All these discoveries can be seen to this day at the British Museum. This film is the story of the dig, the politics that surrounded the dig, the competition to gain control of the dig, what's a dig, and its contents, as well as some of the relationships of the people that were involved. Carrie Mulg Mulligan was, as usual, very good at Edith Pretty. And every time I see Ray Fiennes in a film, I appreciate him more and more. His performance as Basil Brown has a quiet elegance that only an actor of his ability could convey. Watching Ray Fiennes do what Ray Fiennes does in a story that is compelling and beautifully presented, 
makes this film Mondo. Well, now there you go. Well, I love I love this movie. I, I thought I, just, I thought you I would. I love Ray Fiennes. Yeah, well, I love Ray Fiennes too, but I didn't love this movie. But I'll tell you who did love it. My wife also loved it. So you were in her and both good company. Uh, in fact, she doesn't say very often that, wow, that was a really good movie, that she really liked it. But see, for me, I fell asleep four times trying to watch this movie. So that kind of <laughs> goes to show, yes, I, literally, I kept trying to wa start watching it at 1030 at night and I would fall you asleep so every time. Yeah, that's it for sure. Uh, this was, for me, was an easy breezy story. Acting is great from everybody in it. Story slowly trudges forward, sprinkling love interests, love interests, and digging, then some joyful eating, then some more digging, then exciting finds under the ground, then even more digging, then planes crash, then there's more digging. So the movie, the movie has some digging. Yeah, it was digging and I was digging it. Uh, what was the name of this movie again? It was called The Dig. Ah, okay. That kind of makes sense. I, I kind of figured it was something like that after I was watching it for the fourth time. Uh, there was nothing annoying in this film. It has layers and layers and layers of characters, and the development of them was pretty much done pretty well. I felt it was a nice, easy, flowing film with something for everybody who likes watching digging or does, digging up doesn't. stuff as well as digging yeah. up feelings and digging up the past. Nothing you, annoyed you just me. You described everybody. Yeah. No, no it, I'm describing everybody but me, perhaps. Nothing annoyed oh, okay. me, but nothing also made me really love it. Now, Ralph Fiennes was stellar. And if he's not already, this film proves that he is mesmerizing. And I'm pretty sure mm. he's not on our mesmerizing list. But guess who might be showing up later in the podcast? The film was pretty good, but it was just a mother digging meh for me. Hmm. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> if I can't stay awake three times to see a movie, there's I, something wrong with the movie. That's surprising because I, I watch this after a hard day at work. Um, I was actually pretty sleepy and uh, put it on and I perked right up because this movie was fantastic. I enjoyed every second. I love the... You love the, digging? The diamond. I love digging. Um, you know, as per usual, some <laughs> of the relationship stuff I could have done without, but uh, it, uh, it wasn't uh, ridiculous like some other film that we... Yeah, today. see, I found... It's funny because the love interest in this one actually annoyed me. So it's so funny how that was different for you. That's so, yeah. so reversal of fortune. Speaking of yep. reversal of fortune. Uh, okay, so uh, this is something I just want to unpack. Did All we right. really need that many characters? Like there was just so many characters. I'm like, why <laughs> is this like, is this like a Downton Abbey type spinoff movie? Like uh, there was too I'm, many characters I'm, and they tried to develop them many. all. There, there was. There was a there was a lot of characters that you, you needed most of them. And Some the of them. That, uh, yeah. yeah, most of them. I could argue there was probably four that we could have got rid of. <laughs> yeah, maybe two. Maybe two. Yeah, exactly. There was at least two. Minimum two, maximum four. So I, I just had to bring that up. There was too many characters for a dig movie. And not once did anybody say the word Doug, which kind of annoyed mm, me. Because I'm like... I see. If you're going to say dig, you should also say Doug. But they did say a lot of the digging, so. Just watching Ray Fiennes, Ray Fiennes as, uh, as Basil Brown. Oof, good yeah. stuff, man. He, he's great. That, that in, a movie that's, in a movie that's meh. Nah, nah. nah. All, right. All right. Well, I'm more excited to talk about this one. And I don't know how you feel about it. Ooh. I but, guess we're going to find out. Yeah. We, we got to see... Thanks to your recommendation, which is not always great. It was great. my recommendation. Yeah. It was. <laughs> which was my recommendation our is always great. But our friend, yeah. It was originally called The Friend, but it is now, they changed it to Our Friend. Our Friend, which, which I, I, 
I kind of like it as that. our friend. I think it's our friend. I, I think they could. We should have kept the friend when it did the festival circus circuit. It was circus. 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 When it did the festival, festival circuit. Circus. It, they called it the friend. Uh, they should have just yeah, called no, it friend. How about just friend? Yeah, friend. Okay, let's get rid. What, what do we need? R or the? Just yeah, friend. these are get to the get to the point, man. Superfluous words that mean nothing. Yeah. So, <clears throat> our friend. Yeah, our friend. After receiving life-altering news, a couple finds unexpected support for their best friend, who puts his own life on hold and moves into their family home, bringing an impact much greater and more profound than anyone could have imagined. Director Gabriella Cowperthwaite? Is that how it's pronounced? Cowperthwaite? Cowperth? Cowperthwaite? Or is it Cowperthwaite? I say what it's Cowperthwaite. Cowperthwaite. And written <laughs> by Brad Ings In Inglesby? Ingsby? There you go. Inglesby. Inglesby. And uh, based on Matthew Teague's article, The Friend. Okay, so yep. do you see how many writers were in this? I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. There was one based on a second one. It stars Jason Siegel, uh, Is Is Isabel Kai, uh, Violet McGraw, and who else? Isn't that funny? IMDb doesn't even mention him. But motherfucking Casey Affleck. Yeah. The best actor in the Affleck family. There, I said uh, it. That's let's, arguable. Move, let's move on. They're both so good. I don't yeah. know that we need to. But Casey's I better. Think if, I think everybody knows. I think everybody knows Casey's better. Soundtrack was outstanding, mixing classic and modern music into this film. This is a bit of a weird plot and not your typical rom-com drama dying of cancer type movie. Not sure how many people would give up their lives for their friends. Jason Siegel does an outstanding, amazing job in this heavy dramatic role. Yet again, another known comedic actor who is normally not all that funny, but he gives great drama. Not even halfway into this movie, I already felt more for these characters than I do in most films by the time they get to the end of their film. Gabriella Calperthwaite does a great job of weaving the story and character development into a fantastic, caring, unconditional love story to be remembered for years to come. Cherry Jones was a pleasant surprise as Faith. What a great name for a character, so full of faith. I freaking love her in everything. I love the concept that one person can make a difference. Like when Jason Siegel's character was super depressed and he was going off to kill himself. And Game of Thrones warrior babe saves his life by calling of him to come for a walk. Or that calling someone stinky butt can prove their love. I love the quick one-two shots that Gabriella does, like the shot in the car with Casey and his oldest daughter, or the scene where you find out about uh, Dakota Johnson's friends giving up on her. It was a mm. sweet character-driven story of unconditional love from one friend to his two best friends. I loved it, and it was motherfucking Mondo. And I got some things to unpack, but we'll talk about that after. All right. Well, sir, our friend. Uh, this is a film that paints, it, paints an accurate picture of what it's like to live with someone dying from cancer, from the caregiver fatigue to the guilt of taking some time for yourself, even though you really need to get away. Uh, the friends that surround at the, the initial diagnosis slowly disappear as the sickness gets worse. The heartbreak of seeing your loved one becoming a shell of themselves. This film explores all the darkness that is dealing with cancer, yet it also shines a light on what true friendship is. The true friend in this case is Dane, played by Jason Siegel. He is flawed in many ways, but the one thing he has above all else is art. Casey Affleck stars as Matt and Dakota Johnson in her best performance to date, stars as the dying Nicole. The film timeline jumps around, and while I'm not sure that was necessary, I will forgive the writer, as apparently the essay this is based on does the same thing. Throughout the film, we explore events that have taken place over the last 13 years or so that bring us to our 
inevitable destination. All the flaws of every character are clearly presented, which give us a more intimate involvement in the story. The three leads in this really have chemistry. This combined with a realistic story that does not shy away from the dark side of this disease, give this a heartbreaking yet hopeful Mondo. So sweet. You know, this is going to depress me now. Mm. Because we're going into the next segment and I am on a high. But let's unpack a few things here. Okay, so yep. seeing as how you're a super selfish person, do you think you True. would ever do anything of what Jason Siegel did? Could you see putting your life on hold? And I'm not just saying for me or your better half or for maybe your mom or your dad. Would you ever do that? Would you ever, I mean, granted, you're a different person than Jason Siegel's character. Jason Siegel's character didn't have like a job yeah. that was a career, yeah. right? That's, but That's the one thing that we can't over, I mean, really, he had nothing going on. What was he really leaving? Yeah. Having said that, he still, you know, put everything he had into this. So Yeah. I mean, he gave up his girlfriend. So can you, can you imagine with all the people that have affected your life? Do you think mm -hmm. you could do, do you think you'd have the strength to do that? That's, it's a big, it's a big thing. I, I, that's one of those questions that I could answer, but unless I'm in the situation, I can't really answer it. Um, well, the thing that, of the love, I would, right? I would, I would, I would imagine that I would. Um, but, but think of the people from your life. I don't know that for a fact. I mean, think of the people where you're at in your life. You're probably maybe even a little older than what they might've been when this started. Yep. Can you think of a friend that you would do that for? Like family uh, members are different. Like yeah, family, family members, members are, are different. different. Like I think of uh, the crash reel, right? Right. And his brother did that for him too. Quit his life. If there were, see, it's all it's all weird because it's there, there's got to be a need there, and this was a unique situation. So. If there was that need and I was in that situation and I truly felt I could help, yeah, probably. Cool. Would well, you know who it would be for? Like, is there someone in your yeah. life that's had that much of an impact? I don't. But you just if uh, they were someone for me, I, for me, I don't think it. I don't think it would matter. If I if I felt I could make a difference, I'd be all in. Yeah. Unless you know, unless, unless it was going to cause me like ruin, and it was going to, you know. But I could take a year off or whatever, and I could help someone out. That wouldn't be a problem. Very cool. I think I could too. I think for the, yeah. I could, I don't think I could do it for just anybody. It would have to be someone that had such a positive impact on my life. I mean, I wouldn't do it for some jerk down the street, but. <laughs> hey, Bryce, what are you doing this afternoon? I, uh, uh, my wife has cancer. Do you want to hang out for a couple of years? <laughs> yeah. All right. Whatever. <laughs> sure, man. So You're cool. Just You're let, cool. Just let me, uh, just let me let work know. And uh, yeah, I'll be right over. <laughs> I'm taking my sabbatical now for two years and then I'll be back. But yeah, You're it's, lucky. yeah. I mean, I, I, I think there'd be at least a few people in my life I would do it for. And uh, I, I think he's a saint, Jason Siegel. Do yeah, more direct, do more dramatic roles. Yeah. I wish he was, I actually wish he was in uh, uh, more movies lately. He's doing some TV series, which apparently is like critically acclaimed. I can't even remember what it's called. It's a TV series. So uh, I don't even know what it's on, but apparently he's like, you know, producer, writer, actor, something, he's like doing it all. Something, so. something. He's, he's a talented dude. Um, there's no question. He, he, he's always shown that. Um, you see yeah. flashes of that throughout his career. So, yeah, like um, he, I'm, glad that he, I'm glad that he was in this to really showcase the fact that he's, uh, he's a, he really is a, he's a special actor. Uh, dispatches from elsewhere. He's doing something like that. There you go. Yeah, I think that that's it. And I think he, I think he like he's got his fingers and everything. There. I think he writes it. I think he, he maybe he doesn't direct it. I don't know. Well, I didn't he? he it he's in it. Didn't he direct the Muppets when he did the Muppets back a few years ago? Well, he, he's the one that got it rebooted. He may have directed it, but I, I. I yeah. Um, how did he? But, how did but he, he was like, I think he, I think he wrote that as well. I think like he was this was like a passion project well, you're right he did write it that's yeah. you nailed it there you go look at your brain I'm just, I'm, sometimes I'm your just brain pretty face sometimes your brain is I mean, just so working. i am a pretty face but i'm not just a pretty face hmm uh i would make you pick up the soap in the shower that's for sure if we were in prison together and i wouldn't blame you <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Well, you know what time it is. Oh, I do know what time it is. It's hammer. time. It's hammer time. <laughs> Temperature rising. Vision blurring. Rage taking over. Baby, the COVID is starting to make us crazy. And yeah. inclusive of that, apparently, is our fucking government. And so, my rage today is backhandedly at my government, but 100% selfish in the fact that I do not feel and we've talked about this before. I don't feel safe going to my Safeway because the amount of idiots that are walking around there bumping into people and not even knowing where the hell they're going. But we can open up fucking restaurants. So restaurants are officially opening where you can go and dine in them. Now they may be lower, lower capacity, but you cannot tell me a restaurant that has a nine foot ceiling is gonna be safer than a movie theater that has like, I don't know, 50 foot ceiling. So there's tons of airspace, A. And B, we've already been there where we are social distancing and, and we could see this, this. It makes no sense to me. I'm so angry that this is gonna be in stage four, that we're not gonna get to see theaters. And if, if our freaking theaters slash cinemas go bankrupt while these stupid fucking governments are making stupid decisions that, oh, let's send everybody to the restaurants because they're way more important. Guess what? There's probably a hundred to one number of restaurants to theaters. I'm guessing a hundred. What do you think? Maybe a thousand? A thousand restaurants for every one theater? I mean, I don't know how many restaurants we have in our yeah, city, but there's there sure is close. a lot of them. I mean, in my yeah. in my neighborhood alone, there's probably 20 restaurants. Yeah, that's, that's 20 to zero. Yeah, 20 because there's no cinemas in my neighborhood. Exactly. I mean, if we can, there's probably what, maybe 12, 13 cinemas we have in the city? Uh, maybe 20, yeah, maybe count. 20, right? Just maybe. No, there, there, can't, there can't be 20. Well, you count it out while I rage. I'm sure it's yeah. it's somewhere around 20. Okay. You go ahead it's and easy rage. To and look I'll, at I'll, it. Get you, I'll get you a number there. Yeah, so I think it's 20. But you, there's there's no reason why with social distancing, and proper management, which I've never felt safer than when we were in our independent movie theaters because the spacing was done so well and everybody's wearing a mask watching the movies. And we are going to miss some of the best movies. I mean, I'm not sure if um, uh, the new reboot of Super Friends is going to be as great as everybody's hoping it is, but I'm sure it's going to be better than the original. Zack Snyder is hopefully going to give us some darkness. But that's a movie that we're not going to see in theaters, which is the only place you should probably see it is in theaters or at Bryce's house. It And even then I won't be able to do that. So it's like, what the hell? I'm just so angry. I'm so tired of this disease. And then government's doing stupid things. That's that's my rage this week. I want to go back to the cinemas. And, I'm, and there's too many movies coming out that I'm going to have to see it on my... 60 inch TV, and I'm not happy about it. I think there's only like 12 cinemas in the whole place. I think there might be less because I think I counted the plaza. Oh, wow. Uh, anyway, there's not yeah, a lot. That's even more depressing. Mm hmm. It is. It is indeed. All right, sir. What's on your Something mind? There. What is on my mind? All right. Unnecessary romantic subplots have to stop. The latest example of this was the silly side story romance between Miss Maggie and Palmer in the movie Palmer. At their least offensive, these subplots are a mild distraction, and at their most offensive, they can completely wreck a movie. 
I do not understand why there is a notion out there that almost every story needs a romance in it. They do not. If your movie is not a romance, then do not force a romantic subplot into your movie. I don't want to see it. I just don't want to see it at all. If it were not for that irritating relationship sidebar between Miss Maggie and Palmer, that movie could have been Mondo. Thor had Thor and Jane getting together. The Avengers Age of Ultron had Bruce Banner and Black Widow exploring their feelings for each other. What the hell is that? The Hobbit had a strange elf love triangle with two characters that weren't even in the freaking book. And don't forget the inexplicable relationship between Uhura and Scotty in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. These are just a few of the offenders that had annoying romantic subplots, and that is just the ones off the top of my head. Stop it, filmmakers. It is unnecessary, and it just takes away from the story you are trying to tell. That's my rage, Jim. Well, I disagree with some of it because O'Hur and Scotty was one of my favorite love interests of all movies of all time. The fact that Scotty finally got to hook up with anybody, let alone the hottest person that's ever walked into the Star Trek universe is, is like, was the joyous moment I've had in any Star Trek war or battle sequence ever. Star Trek, thank you for giving me O'Hara and Scotty. That's what I want to say about that. And, meh, I'm not going to... I I disagree with you on Palmer. So there we go. And yet, I thought it kind of ruined it for the dig. So it's funny you didn't bring that up. Because <laughs> it didn't. Because it did. I love... Having said that, could, you could leave it out there too, and I'd be just fine with that. Hey, there you go. See, so you're proving your point. If, you're, sometimes if, if your movie you isn't a romance, get rid of the romance. It does, it's not needed. I don't know why Hollywood seems to think that it's that this has to be done. I mean, literally, there's nothing like there's nothing that's even close to that in The Hobbit. But Hollywood gets a hold of it, and I, I don't even like Peter Jackson. Does he not have any control over? It? Like, I don't understand how this got in there. Like, it just made absolutely no sense. Maybe he's a romantic at heart. Who knows? Peter Jackson's a lovable guy. He's like a he's like a little cute bear that you can hug and um, stick in your pocket and you know watch a love story with. Peter Jackson. He's a yeah. He's a bear. I uh, love him. Yeah, he's he's a lovable bear. That's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> oh, Peter Jackson. Well, Rich. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, mm-hmm. I'm only going to throw some mesmerizing out this week because I've dropped a few bombs mm-hmm. already in in this week's episode. So the first person I'm going to bring forward shouldn't be surprised because we talked about him already, and that's Ralph Fiennes. He and likes I, to be called Rafe. Oh, Rafe. Okay, Rafe. Rafe. Rafe Fiennes. I don't know. I've got an uncle. He spells his name the same way. His name's Ralph. My father-in-law's named Ralph, and it's spelled the same too, but whatever. You can call yourself whatever you want, as long as you act as mesmerizing as Rafe finds. I'm assuming that's a yes. That's not even really a... I didn't need to ask you that. (laughs) That is a slam dunk. It's a yes. Okay, so I think you're going to also agree with me on this one. And I'm going to put Go Gene ahead. Squibb forward. Yeah, done. Yeah. I mean, when was the last time you've seen her in a movie where you didn't think to yourself, does it really matter if anyone else is in this movie? She's so right? Good. Right? I yeah. mean, I mean, uh, here you have, um, crap, what was it called? Was it Kansas? The one that, um, God, what the heck? Um, Arkansas. Arkansas. No, not Arkansas. Well, yeah, maybe that. Oh, no. But, um, Kansas? No. What was the one with her? Oh, she, wasn't, she wasn't in Arkansas. Uh... No, she was in... Oh, um... uh, man. It was with... Um... Oh, wait. I'm going to look it up. But yeah, I mean, she is Nebraska. There's the one I'm thinking of. I knew it was a, I knew it was a place. I knew it was a place. Arkansas, Nebraska. I knew it Whatever. was a place. I mean, yes, Nebraska. She was like... 
you know, there's there's amazing, like Will Forte did a great job in there. Bruce Dern was fantastic in there. And Bruce Dern's yeah. great in everything. But you know, yeah. she stole the show. She really did. It doesn't matter what she's in. Yeah. True that. Yeah. Uh, and she's 92 years old. Yeah. She, she has, told me that and I was like, what? Well, she'll be 92 in November, but she's got three yeah. other movies coming out this year. Like, <laughs> fantastic. I know, right? I can't believe it. Okay, I'm going to yeah. give you one. I'm going to give you one more. One more. Yeah. What do you got for me? Make it I'm, good. I'm going to give you Christian Bale. As? As mesmerizing. Christian Bale is mesmerizing. Yep. So what piece of crap has he been in lately that he couldn't be undoubted? Uh, I don't know. Let's find out. I'm pretty sure he was in something crappy. Otherwise, uh, he would have he would have been put forward as the other. Yeah. I'm trying to think what it could have been though, because I seem to enjoy basically everything he's been in. Yeah. Uh, for okay, so let's go. Let's back it up. All right. So he's in Ford versus Ferrari, which was Mondo. Mondo. He did Vice, which was Mondo. Mondo. He did Mowgli, but that was just a voice. Doesn't count. Yes. Uh, he was in uh, Hostiles, which was a man for me. It was a man for me. Mondo. And then he was in The Promise. The Promise. What was The Promise? Uh, the Promise was... Set during the last days of the Ottoman Empire, the promise follows a love triangle between Michael, right. a brilliant medical student. Yeah. yeah, yeah unfortunately, yeah. it was unfortunately, unfortunately, that was a math for me too. So it was. It, see, that was that was a math for me, but that's that's actually a that's actually a double math for me. So, but let's keep going back. Uh, just, to, uh, the big short was a mondo. Mondo. Yeah, King of Cups. Uh, which I did cups, not see. Nine of Cups I did see, and cups. it was meh. meh. Okay. And then you've probably seen this one. It was also a meth for me, was Exodus, Gods and Kings. Yeah, that was actually meth, too. So, that gets so that's the back back meth here. So we both, so we both, we both, he didn't make it either one. But then you go to American Hustle, uh, which I, I don't actually love that movie. It was that would have been a yeah. man for me. Um, Mondo out of the furnace. I know I've seen it, but I don't remember it. Yeah, I actually right. like that one. I liked it way better than American Hustle. That would have been a Mondo for me. And then he's in the dark. Oh night, yeah, now is... that I'm looking at the yeah Mondo. Yeah, yeah. So he's 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 mesmerizing, but he's not. Uh, he's not. He's uh, so undoubted. close to Mondo. Yeah, but he, it's he, like he he's got... probably. He's, He's probably got a better Mondo percentage than some of the guys that we have in Mondo. He just happened to make a back-to-back -back mess for the both of us. So, And both different movies. Well, no, one of them was overlapping. One of them was overlapping. Have been, or I should say, as, a, as some of the guys we have in Undoubted, he's probably got a better overall percentage of Mondo. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I'm, I'm just looking down at this, and there's a whole lot of Mondo in here. Mm -hmm. But, oh, well. That's why it's hard to get on the list. If Christian Bale can't get on the undoubted list, you know that is a freaking hard list to get on. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Okay, so is he and that's mesmerizing? That's the way it should be. Oh, yeah. Is he mesmerizing? Of okay, he's, good. Of course he's mesmerizing. Just All right. watch The Machinist and tell me he's not mesmerizing. Oh, uh, yeah, that's... Oh, my God. Or Vice. I love that movie. Or Vice. Or Vice. Plays not yeah. Like, he's, he's brilliant. Or any other movie he's in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's face it. Like, you want to... Yeah, Make kinda, your choice. I kind of want to see him and June Squibb in a movie together, and Ralph Fiennes. Oh, Wouldn't that be great? Let's put them all in. <laughs> then imagine write us, the script. Let's write the script and send it off to them. Imagine them. Imagine though, they're all on screen together. Which one would we be looking at? That could uh, be that's the a good question. This this could be a test. You know, we should start filtering our mesmerized list. We got to go back and watch some of the movies where we've put. Yeah 
two people that are mesmerizing in the same movie. In the same movie, and, and see then which, we, which we which one mesmerizes the other one out of the uh, scene, and then they get mesmerize cut. off. Yeah, I, I kind of think we should do this. Let's do a mesmerize off. Let's go through the list. This is what we're doing for next yep. week, people. We're gonna go through the mesmerize list, and we're gonna see if there's a mesmerize off, and then we're gonna take one out. Because so if, if they get out mesmerized, they're off the list. That's right. But then like we, we got to make it. We got to make it so that it's, it's got to be unanimous. Like, so if we well, both come, come up with, yeah, yeah, because if we both see the same movie, go, no, no, I thought they were best. <laughs> but then we might have to go back to if they've been in two movies together, or we have to do. We'll have to make a decision. We'll chat yeah. between now and next week, and we'll come All up right. with with a strategy of. We'll have to try and figure out who's been with each other in movies. Oh, man, you're creating way more work for us, man. I love it. I mean, football season's over pretty much, so you're, you're yeah, cutting down one, your numbers. One game to go. Yeah. That's right. So you're going to have nothing but time. That is true. I'm going to pass the baton to you to start making lists. <laughs> Ooh. All, All right. right. Let's rage. Mm -hmm. Last week on Rage or Dare, Jim pulled crossroads from my craptastic musical bag of oral pleasure and then spent most of the week cleaning malware from his computer. Apparently, you cannot legally buy, stream, or find that piece of garbage anywhere. So, a suitable replacement was luckily found. In the <laughs> 1980s Village People classic, Can't Stop the Music. This week, Jim and I get to choose Rage or Dare. Let's check in with Jim and see if he could or could not stop listening to the music. This is what you get, Jim, when you can't find my original choice. I think I kind of lucked out a little bit because I you watched might, almost... You might have. In all of the trailers that I started watching of Crossroads... The yeah. trailers alone were painful to watch. I can't imagine having to watch the entire movie. All right. Have, well, have you, you actually have seen to. it? By the way, I no, ah, uh, no, I haven't actually. This is a, <laughs> this is there's about there were two movies in the bag that I haven't seen, and you already watched one of them. And I can't remember, and you did not like it. Um, <laughs> this was the other one. The rest of them I had, I have seen. So there were there were two movies in the bag that I hadn't seen, and this was one of them. And I am going to be on the lookout, though, every time I'm in a value village, every time, because as soon as I find Crossroads, it's going straight to you, because you're still watching this, because you plucked it from the bag. I so want at some to. point, So at some point, you're watching this piece of crap, because I'm going to find it. I know you and will. And you are going to watch it. Okay, well, I'm okay at with that. At any rate, that's for a future episode. It will be. Keep Stay tuned, people. You'll never know. I'm, it might be next week, even. The, everything will stop if we find crossroads. Everything. Everything. And I mean everything. We might just do a whole episode dedicated to crossroads. <laughs> the crossroads episode. The one you've been waiting for. The one not the Ralph been... Macchio crossroads. No. The Britney Spears crossroads. I almost tried to get out of it and actually just watch the Ralph Macchio crossroads, which actually yeah, isn't that watch, bad of watch a movie. Ralph Ma yeah, well, watch Ralph Macchio it's a playing a little blues guitar. Yeah. That's right. Wrote a song about it. Well, here, here yeah. it goes. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about can't stop the music. Can't. Now, you're kind of seeing now why I dress as a pirate. Aren't the Richie sisters in this movie too? Some kind of sisters. There was there was some kind of sisters. Yeah, they're the Richie <laughs> sisters. So Steve Gutenberg. Yes. Why does Steve Gutenberg not do Shakespeare? <laughs> or maybe or maybe shakes the beer. I don't know. Yes. Also, who knew he could roller skate so well? The first five minutes of the movie is him roller skating through New, New York Frisco. I couldn't tell what city it was in. I think it yes. was New York because there was, was some scenes. Yeah, okay. So I was a yeah. little confused as I'm watching mm -hmm. it through the first song and the intro because I thought they were in New York. But then they showed these three ladies walking down the street wearing San Cisco Fran shirts together as the oh. three of them. And then he had to stop on his roller skates and correct them. So they were walking down the street together. 
and it said San Francisco. All three of them. Really? Yes. Maybe they were. I don't think they were in San Francisco. No, it's definitely New York because it's the village. <laughs> well, well, that's they, odd. Well, maybe it is. I. You know what? It's it's either. Well, they they flew to San Fran. Anyway, it was really confusing. That sounds like a hilarious scene, by the way. Did, it you, was, did you laugh as hard as I'm picturing you right now? Uh, I was, yeah. So, okay. Um, yeah, it's coming. Uh, <laughs> Steve Gutenberg has some tremendous comedic timing. Okay. I mean, just, so, watch them, just watch them Police Academy movies. I have the whole collection. And they're, I'm really, sure you do. they're really bad awful. So in 1978, <laughs> let's go back in time. In 1978, right. yeah. Gutenberg makes, and probably one of the best movies of the 1978s, Boys from Brazil. That movie is That's outstanding. Yeah. That's a good movie. Then in 1980, he makes this movie. Mm -hmm. And then after he makes this movie, he also makes another amazing film in Diner. Yeah. So he's got, he's literally created a rage sandwich. He's got two <laughs> Mondos as the bread and he's got, can't stop that, like, his career should have been over after making this movie. The first five minutes in, I was thinking to myself, wow, this is the best bad movie I've ever seen. The first five minutes was awesome. Switching up the girls to say San Francisco. It was classic Steve. It was fantastic. Uh, but then I got to minute six. And boy, was I wrong. 15 minutes into this movie, my sexuality was in severe question. So many hot people be them gay, be them straight, all in this mixed up roles. I couldn't figure out what was happening. I wasn't sure what I was watching. It was so confusing. So much sort of hinting that some of the people in this movie might be gay. But then they showed the half naked indigenous village person flirting with a 40 year old woman. And I'm like, what? What's happening here? Is he gay or is he not gay? Like, I always thought, you know, that was the greatest thing about the village people. They were loud and proud and, and gay and on the street. But no, apparently in this movie, in the 1980s, it still wasn't safe to be gay in a movie. Where they hint at it so many times, they actually, they actually talk, oh, they're from the village. These people are weird. They have uh, Caitlin slash Bruce Jenner actually making fun of the fact that these people are weird, but they don't come out and say any anti-gay things. They just hint at it everywhere. And it's so badly done. So the village people wear their stereotypes in their everyday life. This is something I did not know. Who knew Philip A or Philip or Philip A wears his Indian costume in everyday life? I didn't know this. Uh, and, you know, I did love that all the villagers were brought together in this super duper group in a way that was way ahead of its time. It was like a gay Avengers uniting to save the world from not having enough disco. Almost each one of them having their own private entry song to showcase their limitless talents. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe not all of them. They kind of started mm -hmm. to do that and then they changed their mind and not everybody got to sing their in own intro song. So I was a little bit confused by that too. Huh. Other than this, I'm not sure what the plot for this movie was. Uh, so we have the village people music in conjunction with Steve Gutenberg's unlimited skills of acting and comedy. And it's basically the coming together of the village people. So was this a biopic? I'm not really sure. So let's have a quick recap. First off, I'm a big believer in UBU, but I'm not sure if dressing like a Native American all the time when you're not one is inappropriate or not, even if it's 1980s. Acting was not macho, man. Songs very much do stop the music. The plot was left in the drain at well, the YMCA. Dialogue was ready for the 80s. See what I'm doing here? Yeah. Caitlyn Jenner's alter ego Bruce was not magic night. All in all, this movie was funny bad for a while. Then it got progressively worse as this film went on and on until it was no longer funny. And by that, I mean six minutes in. The only saving grace 
was the 10 minute concert of the one song at the end of the film that never ended. It was the song that never ended. It kept going on and on and more of the characters would come out and dance to it. There was so much glitter. I felt like I was at a gay rave. It was really the best part of the movie was the last 10 minutes. Also, I'm not sure why anyone thought it'd be a good idea to put Bruce Jenner in this movie that he could potentially act. I mean, what was he, a decathlete at the time? I don't get it. Uh, like, what, what was happening here? I not, um. never thought I would ever say this aloud, but I wish this musical had more music so that I did not have to hear the god-awful dialogue that was being portrayed. And the icing on this musically turd-decorated cake is that the only way I could stream this terrible 80s blunder was to buy it. So now, <laughs> so now I own this in my collection forevermore. My favorite line, this definitely calls for tits and tears. And my favorite scene is where Bruce Jenner almost burns his penis off. Huh. I guess a few years too early for that one, maybe. Just me. Yeah. 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 Uh, this had the gayest band on the planet and they had to skirt around the fact that they were gay through the entire movie. Although now I know how the group was formed. So yeah, I'm convinced this is a biopic. There you go. Uh, it you was, know what the best part of it was? It was terrible. It was, it was, it was over two hours long. <laughs> it was two hours long. I always love it because you know, when I, when I was trying to find Crossroads and Monique's going to me, why are we trying to watch this movie? I'm like, I have to watch this movie. And then so when we had to get, we had to get this one, she's like, she was doing work and she comes out halfway through. She says, why are you watching this movie? And I'm like, this I love is that. a replacement for Crossroads. Yeah. But we were both glued to the set when they actually went to the YMCA to film a video. Because right. everybody was naked, including the, you know, the main actors and all the, everybody. It was just like a big nude fest. So it was great. Uh, uh, so it sounds like you really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, it was a rage. It was not yeah. nine lives quality, but it was, it was pretty close. <laughs> pretty close. <laughs> all right. Ha. Now we got to pull. That, that so what are we doing? Happy. You want to pull from Murray uh, or do you want to pull from our bag of dare? Honestly, there is such a big pile of crap on my desk right now. I've got the dare bag here. I think let's we go dare do it. Just, let's just because it's gonna be a, there'd be a lot of dead air while I look for Murray's bag if we go the other way. So yeah, let's uh, let's pull it out. See what happens. I know it's gonna be glorious because that's all I get from this bag. No, you forget. Every time I'm involved, it's not always glorious. <laughs> mm. It might end up being a mess. That's that's could be the balance of it. All right. So, what does that oh, say? Oh. Go over a little bit more. Dog Eat Dog from 2016. Dog Eat Dog from 2016. Have you ever seen that it? Seems, uh, I want to say maybe. I'm, uh, no, I'm, I'm curious. I, let's, uh, let's it has Nicolas Cage, quick. Willem Dafoe, a crew of ex-cons are hired by a Cleveland mafioso to kidnap the baby of a rival mobster. We get more baby. Yeah, I've seen this. And Nicolas Cage is in it, so it can't be bad, right? <laughs> uh, having said that, I just watched uh, Vampire's Kiss last night. Oh, it's about time. time. Is that the first time? No, I've seen it before. I had forgotten how absolutely glorious Nicholas. I don't even know what that accent he was doing. It was part, part like part uh, kind of Greenwich blue blood part kind of Valley girl. Like, yeah. it, was, it was bizarre. He's a genius. And that movie. I was just in awe of, I, it was, it wasn't good, <gasps> but I was in, I, I was, no, I'm sorry. But I was in such awe of it that it was quite enjoyable to watch. Like, you know, I know that I'm watching a bad movie, but I'm enjoying it so much. So I guess it's not a bad movie. No, it's not. I, I loved every minute of it. But, but guess what? Man. I have news for you. I have really yeah. good news for you. Remember how we had to go yeah. to the mesmerizing list to see yeah. if we can get somebody off it? 
Well, I'm pretty sure that Willem Dafoe and Nicolas Cage are on the mesmerized list. This could be the movie that takes one of them off. All right. This could throw be down. it. It's Nick a throwdown. Nick Cage versus Willem Dafoe. <laughs> Actually, I just have to double check. I'm pretty sure Willem Dafoe is on it. We know Nick Cage is on it because he got on there with George. Yeah, Willem Dafoe. I'm positive Willem Dafoe is on it. I'm pretty sure he is too. But oh, this, this is, is this is this just got a whole lot. This is dog eat dog. Yeah, it is, because they're definitely both mesmerizing. Yeah. Yeah, Willem Dafoe. the dog is. Willem Dafoe was our 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16th person we put on the list. There you go. And, and Cage is at the bottom, of, pretty close to the bottom of the list. This is a mesmerize off, people. This is awesome. Yeah. This is exciting. It has to be unanimous. It has to be unanimous. Has to be unanimous. If I pick pick Cage and you pick the foe, then they're both still They both stay. But if we both pick one of them, the other one is done. Gone. Never to return. Never to return. off the list Unless unless they make a new movie and they take take someone else off the list. So if they go against another mesmerize in another movie, then that person comes no. off. It's like they took their spot because they can become more mesmerizing as they get older. Mm. Right? Uh, it's possible. Go- I don't know. I don't know. I got to think about all this. You got too many scenarios running through my pea brain right now. It's true. I love it. Yeah. All right. All right. Well. <laughs> Whoa. This was such a mind blow, people. It was like so much fun. I hope you guys enjoy listening. Thanks to all the ragers for listening to our show and supporting us. We can't thank you enough. We hit 3,000 list, 3,000 followers on Twitter recently, and we want to thank all of them as well. Thanks to Extended Film Rage crew of Leonard Conlon for artistic vision and photography via Leonard Conlon Photography. And but buddy, we miss you. We want uh, want to do some more work with you. So let's let's get together when this is over. Uh, listen to us on podcast streaming sites everywhere and check us out at Film Rage YYC on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Check out our face or Facebook. Check out our website at filmrageyyc.com. We are always wanting your feedback to make this a raging blast for our listeners. So please go on social media, Apple Podcasts, our website, or Podchaser, and give us feedback. Or give us some dares. Could you bring us the next nine lives? Could you bring us the next? Don't stop the music. Please make us rage. No matter what you do, please, please make us rage. That's it for this week. Rage on. Rage on.